You're listening to Spellbound. Welcome to episode 37 of Spellbound. I'm Julian Smith. Today's episode is slightly longer than 45 minutes. That's because there's so much good stuff in here. I didn't want to shave any of it out. I wanted you to have it all. We're talking about money today. WTF is it? Also the origin of fiat currencies. Interest. Also global economies and how they interact and affect each other. There's a lot of good stuff in here. You don't want to miss it. Spellbound is now a CastBox original. You can still listen to it anywhere else you typically listen to podcasts, but check out CastBox today and see what's making it the fastest growing and highest rated podcast app for both ios and android two damn white guys are back i'm back you're back i was, I was wondering what you would do if i said it that way because that's your catchphrase i was like what is he gonna do if i say we're back i just have to say the same phrase uh, this is not fair we're here talking about wtf is money what is it what is money no it's, money no problems it's yeah i mean i got 99 problems and is a bitch one or not? I can't remember. I can't remember how the lyric goes. <laughs> I don't think we're allowed to say how that. How does the lyric go? <laughs> hey, Jay-Z said it. I'm not, it's not my words. It's not my words. We're off to a spectacular start already. But yeah, what is money? It's interesting because it's it's such a big part of, of modern society, money. And you could also say that money is now like integral for survival. In most places, in a yeah. lot, of, in a lot of places, at least. Yeah. And uh, and so it's interesting that this that, that, that we now rely on this man-made structure. Money can be exchanged for goods and services. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, I guess <laughs> what was? Do you know the first currency ever to exist? No, I mean, no one really knows that because I think humans have been trading in some form of currency since before history existed really yeah yeah seashells wasn't it oh seashells oh any any anything that's about money is basically just something that is rare so it can't just be created by anyone and it can be a, it's a media of, of exchange so i can give you a seashell that's rare you don't have that seashell therefore it's prized to you so you'll give me food in exchange you'll give me some i don't know Tur sea turtle or something, whatever, you, whatever you're cooking, f fish in exchange. Interesting. You could almost say money is novelty. Yeah. So it would be confidence. Mm, yeah. Consumer money confidence. is confidence. Yeah. It's confidence that you can take that and then buy something else with it. It's basically a promise. So it's, it's, um, the other thing is, as it's a fiat. So basically it's stand, it's a stand in for something else. Barter system comes before money basically. Mm -hmm. Right. So I could give you like 10 sacks of grain in exchange for your cow. I don't know if that's proper exchange rate, but anyway. Yeah. Also my cow is, it has a name and I really, it's my kids are attached to it and you know, all these other things. So maybe it's worth a lot more to me than it is to you. Right. Well, that's, that's true. Uh, but it's a lot easier if I just give you like five gold coins right? Because they're smaller, more portable. And mm -hmm. then those five gold coins have some value to you. And you, then you can give them to someone else for a goat. Ah, uh, and money's not sentimental. Actually, that's an interesting yeah, distinction. Actually, that's true too. It's worth the same to everyone. Uh, yeah, at least it should be. It's not worth the same to everyone. And that's why we have exchange rates. Well, yeah, it's, it's worth the same amount to everybody who's participating Nominally, in that currency. Yeah, to some extent. Like even today, like US dollars are only worth something because the government is able to tax people and take revenue, basically, like uh, have revenue come in and gather resources from its citizens, right? And that's why it's worth something because we believe that the U.S. Treasury can actually make more money, can control money, and it will still have value down the road. So could it ever not have value? Yeah, sure. That's massive inflation, like right. in Venezuela. This for is example. why civilizations crash, right? Well, or it's, it's one, one reason. reason. It could be associated with it. Yeah, it could be a reason civilizations crash. Yeah. Um, so basically, if there's too much money, so what you, what you can do is just print more money. Like, why can't the government just print as much money as it wants? Money is basically paper. Yeah, but then like but then the consumer cash. confidence goes down because if people find out that they're just printing money, you know, we already know that there's no gold backing any of it anymore because it's fiat. Well, what is gold even? I mean... Well, gold's a novel item. It's a, it's a finite item. Uh, to some extent. But so what happened in Europe in the 1500s when the Spanish went to America and started taking all the gold from the Incas and the Aztecs and shipping it back to Europe, the amount of gold in Europe tripled within about 100 years. And this meant the prices massively increased. So like a sack of flour cost three times as much hundred years later, like in 1600 than it did in 1500, right? It so, costs more because there was more money. Yeah, exactly. Because mm. this is like supply and demand. It's, 
Yeah, it's supply and demand of money. Yeah, this is what inflation is. Basically, if you have more money chasing the exact same number of goods, then each of those goods is worth more in proportion to the money. Like money is just a medium of exchange. That's what inflation is. And so you can't boost your economy by just printing more money because you have just more currency and the currency is then worth less because the currency has to be able to buy goods. And if there aren't enough goods for the money to buy, then it costs more money to buy those goods. And then the money is effectively worth less. Is that stand a reason that if more money comes into play, it's okay if there's more products being sold? Yeah, there is an expansion of money over time, always. And there is a normal kind of rate of inflation. Typically, that's around 2%. That's what the Treasury goes for. So typically, inflation is around 2%. That's what the U.S. government aims for. You said money has existed since before civilization and before history. Yeah. I guess what I'm interested in is, obviously, people have always bartered. People have yeah. always, like, traded time. Yeah, you can and trade the, a good for a good. That's yeah. obvious. And, and even, you know, people used to, like, trade their kids. Almost their, their kids were kind of a form of currency at one point. <laughs> well, you yeah. You know, they would, but... like, marry off their daughters and for, in exchange oh, sure. for partnerships. And, you know, actually, arranged marriages well, are another version of this. sold themselves into slavery, like, in the Middle Ages and that stuff. Too. Yeah. Uh, that's what serfdom is, basically. Mm. If you can't afford to eat... Uh, then you put yourself at the mercy of a lord and in exchange for protection, uh, you give him your labor, basically. Hmm. So that's serfdom. Uh, so yeah, yeah, definitely that, that could happen. And definitely people sold like kids and stuff into slavery and serfdom. And Harsh times. Like yeah. People in ancient Babylon were paid in beer. Really? Yeah. Beer. Beer. That was their wages. The, some of the earliest writings we have actually are pay slips from ancient Babylon, which have the amount of beer you earned for toiling in a field. Yeah, but I guess what I'm getting at is that there was a time where you, you're talking about money having existed for longer than society itself. And I guess yeah. I'm wondering how useful was money before society, because it seems like, you know, people people have always bartered and stuff and they've always traded novel yeah. items. But when did it actually, I mean, t well, t today we see money as like a means of survival. It's like a resource. It's like an, it's got an energy to it. Yeah. And, and how long has it been that way? That's probably just with the advent of agriculture and stuff, right? Yeah, it's with the advent of agriculture. So goods have always had value. You can always trade one good for another. And the ability to use money is based on the recipient also viewing that money as valuable, right? So it has to be rare, like gold, for example. And if you think that gold is valuable and I think that gold is valuable, I can give you gold and you will give me a goat because you know that you can use that gold to give it to some other farmer for his cow, for example. But if you don't perceive that it has value, if I just say I have these seashells and... <laughs> You know, and you say, well, I don't care about those seashells and no one cares apparently about my seashells, then you're not going to perceive that it has value and you're not going to accept it in exchange for your goods. But it's kind of like Bitcoin. Like, where can you spend Bitcoin today? Some places, like some stores accept Bitcoin, some eateries, some like food trucks, I think, accept Bitcoin. Not that many, right? So Bitcoin certainly has an alternative speculative value as kind of an investment in some sense. But in terms of you being able to use it, only certain places accept Bitcoin, so it only has value as a currency in some locations. When and how did money become like, there's there's clearly some kind of order behind it that, yeah. I mean, obviously capitalism is kind of a hierarchy that's kind of messed up, but, you know, I mean, it's not entirely messed up. Obviously, you're, you're giving me the Andrew Rader eyebrows, <laughs> the fact-checking eyebrows. <laughs> you know, it's it's not to say that it's, that it's totally devoid of any positive traits. I mean, capitalism is a great motivator for innovation and, you know, we, we owe a lot to it, but there are definitely, it is kind of based on like a hierarchy. It is kind of like a parasitical system where people up top do less and people at the bottom do the most. And, you know, this is the foundations of conspiracy theory is like what gets done with the money at the top, right? Hmm. I'm kind of weighing your statements and trying to see how much I believe that they're true. I'm not sure. So <laughs> it's, it's a really polite <laughs> insult. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really true that like a lot of people in, in the United States, for example, are wealthier than others. And uh, well, it's no surprise that someone like like Mark Zuckerberg is way better off than somebody at the bottom and that people at the bottom are doing like the people who run his corporation are doing way more work than him. Now, he's required to do a very specific set of tasks over and over and over and over and over. And so is everybody else. But in terms of, you know, manual labor, he's off putting a lot of that to the people at the bottom of the corporation. 
Uh, yeah, but he pays them for their labor quite really, really well, actually. At Facebook, I'm not. Yeah, I, I, that's. I'm not saying that that he's not paying them well and that people aren't happy. I mean, I, I actually know people at Facebook that are very happy working there. I, that's not even the point. I'm just saying that at some point somebody came up with this. Like, somebody saw people bartering these seashells and stuff that you're talking about that predate mm. civilization, and they were like, "Hey, this is a genius system." And how do we like institutionalize money? It's kind of like a short form. So it's basically it's easy. It's more transportable, right? If you mm-hmm. wanted to transport your goat, if what if you don't have a goat? Goat. you can have just some seashells saved or something like that. The, the whole point of a uh, money you is love that these seashells yeah well seashells have been used by many societies as forms of currency so that's i guess why we go back to them but uh, if you ever try to like split a pizza with me with seashells or something <laughs> yeah they're still used in uh I think parts of Africa as currency, certainly some Pacific islands, things like that uh, have been as well for a long time. Uh, Native Americans use seashells called wampum as currency Mm. in Connecticut. And they were basically like dyed seashells. Uh, Actually, seashells are the origin of the color purple, which is why purple is no, uh, the noble color. So, cause it was really rare. So a lot of these seashells were really rare from Tyre the Phoenicians. And that's, uh, that's why like the Roman emperors and the um, Praetorian guard wore purple robes hmm. and capes. It was novel. We keep yep. coming back to this idea of novelty. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be rare or else what's, you know, if anyone can get it, then it loses all its value. This actually is an interesting next point. Maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but this begs the question. What do we do when everybody has the same amount of money? Because that's what we're heading towards. Everybody's, you know, at you some just point, said it's the opposite. You said that the rich were getting richer and the poor are not, which is actually the case. Like the the one percent, the wealthy uh, are accumulating more and more wealth because when you have money, you invest it. I'm assuming you're first of all, you're right, but I'm assuming that this what I just said is assuming that over the next 15 years or however long. Uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and all these people who have all this money are actually going to follow through with, you know, some of their ideas that they're that they're suggesting about like re- redistributing their own wealth. And I think it's ultimately going to come down to that. Yeah, but the purpose of redistributing their wealth is to raise the standard of living of the lower people, but right, it's not necessarily to reduce the level of the upper people. So basically, over time, like so, when you talk about the economy of the United States and, and wealth distribution, it's a pie. You can think of it like a pie, right? Right. And the pie is not evenly distributed. Many people have much more, a much larger slice of the pie, right? right? But the pie itself is growing, right? Right. And so... Yeah. So there's more money being made? There, There is. There's more actually. money being printed? Uh, yeah. Well, so it's... So this is the other thing is money is not really cash. There's a big difference between printed money and actual... Uh, money is... And available from, funds. From, from cash. Right, right. So so I think only um, 9% or less of all money has ever existed now as cash, like all the money in circulation. So most money is just numbers in a bank account, right? It's just right. like bits, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ones, zeros, elect- electrons. And so what is money then at that point? It's based on the rule of law. It's basically we have a society that recognizes property rights that allows you to accumulate whatever money you have and we recognize that as yours and we all agree that you have that much and we all agree that I have this much and someone else has this much and we follow the rules and agree that that is how the money is distributed and we can only transfer it through certain kinds of exchanges uh, through buying goods, selling goods, gifting, but there's tax implications of everything. So yeah. I mean, but but basically, it doesn't matter if money is ever cash. It's just what you own. It's property. It's a form of property. And now, nowadays, it's mostly digital. This actually has huge implications on the universal basic income, which up to this point, I've had pretty much, I mean, I've had questions about it, but I've been like generally in favor of it, I guess, even though I know that's kind of like a polarizing thing to say. I know there's a lot of people who don't know how they feel about the universal basic income, but it's almost like what you're saying is in opposition to that because we're talking about redistribution and how that wouldn't, you're basically saying that wouldn't help. No, I'm just saying that redistribution helps. It certainly helps people at the bottom, but it doesn't make them equal to people at the top. Right. Because the people at the top are still kind of uh, like, I guess, driving society forward and making like the, 
mean, they're making well, like the more you have, the more risky you make. They're making basically risky like changes. because of investments and stuff like that. If you have tons and tons of money, you make more and more money, but because you use your money to make money, because money has value over time. There's mm-hmm. a time value of money. Like ten dollars today is not the same as ten dollars five years from now. Right. Right. That's based on inflation, but it's also based on investment because your money can be doing things because money is the ability to procure goods and services and also basically stimulate activity by doing so. Everyone talks about this story where the Dutch purchased Manhattan Island, which is New York City, from the Native Americans for $16. What? It's actually unclear whether it was worth $16. They were using guilders and they actually paid for it using trade goods. But this is sort of the so it's unclear you often whether, hear. whether it was purchased for sixteen dollars or whether it was worth sixteen dollars. Uh, so it's unclear whether uh, the goods that they used to purchase it actually equated to 16. equate to sixteen dollars. But there's people who are trying to argue that this is how much it was bought. Yeah, for. yeah. Well, I mean, I think the figure works out. So it's it's hard to convert money because over vast periods of time, like centuries, because uh, there's a lot of problems with it. Because no matter how much money you had in the year. Uh, 1600, let's say you couldn't buy an air conditioner. You couldn't buy a television. Mm -hmm. You couldn't buy a polio vaccine, Mm -hmm. right? There's certain goods you just can't even buy. So how much money is, are those things worth to a person from the 1600, right? (laughs) So we use like general inflationary calculators and stuff like that. Um, But if the native Americans, let's say actually did receive $16 back in uh, 1620 or 30 for Manhattan Island and had invested that in the stock market. I mean, there really wasn't a stock market at that point, especially not in New York City. Wall Street didn't even exist yet. Wall Street uh, was just about to exist because the Dutch actually built it there after they purchased Manhattan (laughs) Wall Street. Hmm. (laughs) So it was Dutch. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that goes back to right to the founding of New York City. So what we're talking about now. Uh, And the first... Stock Exchange was actually built by the Dutch in Amsterdam. Really? Yeah. The Dutch. The Dutch. They're the smart. Dutch were the founders of most of our ideas today, actually, in terms of a lot of our science was founded by the Dutch. Uh, certainly, most of our economics was founded by the Dutch. So anyway, if the Native Americans, assuming they received $16, had invested that in the stock market, they would uh, have recouped trillions of dollars on that, more than the property value of manhattan today so wow. it's actually kind of a bargain yeah that they got i mean it looked at from that perspective obviously but they didn't receive actual cash and there was no stock market to invest it in and yeah and we also don't un- know what they actually paid and it's unclear that they recognize land ownership and all that kind of stuff so what what did you say well i was just saying it's, it's cl- unclear what they paid to begin with it sounds like right yeah yeah what they were paid yeah mm-hmm. i guess what's interesting is if I'm the head hunt, if I'm like the king of this, of some like land or something, if I've got off, I've inherited all yeah. this land, I want it to be a prosperous land. And yeah. I want to like contrast myself against all my surrounding civilizations, which I'm competing yeah. with. I want to create as much stability for the people who are living off of my land as possible. So I want to create some kind of system for them that's going to like give them some sense of purpose or something or, you know, make them feel like they're making a difference and that they're involved directly with what's happening and I think like money is a big part of that, right? Well, you sound like totally different from any dictator throughout history. You're talking about you as a king or a dictator and what you want to do is raise the condition of your people. But that doesn't sound like any other dictator I've ever heard of. Well, basically. I guess, yeah, well, maybe I'm being a little palace. fair. I guess what I'm saying is that if uh, I'm actually I'm actually in attempting to describe something much more uh, terrible and uh, corrupt <laughs> I guess what I'm getting at is that there's always somebody at the top who's benefiting from the work of the people at the bottom. Yeah, but that I think that's separable from money. I don't think money could be could have no one at the top. You can have a complete flat but society. But why invent it? Uh, it's just a convenient mechanism of exchange. Okay, so if you're a merchant from Venice, let's say Venice was a big trading city. Back Not Venice in- Beach. Not one of these guys no, that hands out their mixtape. Not Venice Beach, <laughs> Venice, Italy. Um, if you're a merchant from Venice and you're making trade deals around the Mediterranean, you're sailing your ship basically, and you're buying insurance, and you're all you're basically, let's say, you're going to Cairo to pick up spices. You're going to Egypt to pick up spices. This was Venice. Was, How did was, you know where, why I'm going to Egypt next week? Because uh, Venice was heavily involved in the spice trade, so I guess I'm stereotyping you oh, okay. as a Venetian trader. Yeah. So. 
instead of having to bring like 40 oxen to pay for the spices to barter for the spices or whatever else it is whatever kinds of goods and maybe they don't even need oxen so you bring 40 oxen and it's a total waste because they have too many oxen already in egypt right so it's easier to have a convenient mechanism of exchange this is why banks were created actually Hmm. um so banks are not just inherently corrupt uh, no, I mean, banks do make profits, but a uh, bank serves a purpose. The purpose is to keep your money safe and be able to go to a different location and access that money. So they have different branches. So br- banks were created in the Italian Renaissance by Florence, which is, have you ever heard like Florins? That's like an old word for money. You might hear it in like a medieval context or something like that. Mm-mm. Florence. No. So that used to be what, like the inter- first international currency from Florence. Huh. Um, and they called it Florence. Florence, yeah. That's like old form of money. So this is the the oldest one we know of? Uh, No, no. It's just the oldest kind of international coin, I guess. Oh, it's an international currency. Yeah, like it was used, It was accepted throughout Europe, for example. Yeah. And so, so people would take these on these excursions instead yeah, of bringing yeah. so their people, animals. Well, they wouldn't take them is the point because oh. um, they would get attacked by pirates. They'd just PayPal them. Well, they deposit them in the bank... Close. I think you know how a bank works, but basically the, <laughs> the, the, the Venetians would like deposit their money in a bank, right? The Bank of Florence. And then they would go to Cairo where there was a branch, presumably, and they would withdraw the money to buy the spices, right? And then they'd bring the spices back and then they'd earn a bunch of money and then they'd deposit their money back in the bank and the bank would keep it safe for them. For a small fee. Because it was easier than actually bringing all of your assets with you. Yeah. Easier and vastly safer. Right. Because a pirate can't just like come and attack you. Mm. Right. And it's guaranteed. Right. Right. So that's a bank is a good idea. A bank is to keep your money safe. It was better than your mattress because if someone breaks into your bedroom, they'll just like steal all the money from under your mattress. Right. Plus you can invest it instead of just having it sit in, in an account. Or you can be one of these like gold crazed people and have like you know 10 pounds of gold in your closet have you been watching alex jones no but i <laughs> but i know people that he, that do this that, that oh, get really? all the, they get all the gold and they keep it so i mean gold i'm is, not actually saying yeah, people should do that no gold tends to uh be opposite of market performance so basically if the market is doing really well uh then gold does poorly and vice versa because it's kind of a hedge and it's the same reason that gold is was a, a currency throughout europe is because uh historically it, it was a commodity that was in short supply, so it could be used as a medium of exchange. It's rare. So if you have gold, I know there's not a lot of other gold out there, so it has value, um, and I can take that from you in exchange for something else, and then I can spend it somewhere else. It was gold, But gold was like one of the first uh, currencies, right? Because it was, it was like one of the first finite minerals. Yeah, I don't know if it was like one of the... F- First, as opposed to things like seashells. And by the way, You'd love another, the seashells. a very unusual type of currency is like statues or rocks that don't move. So your currency doesn't have to be mobile. Like some islanders, I think, have these currency, which are like basically statues or, or rocks or something like that. And they just say, I own this rock. And now I'm transferring ownership of this rock to you. And you now own this rock and you can spend it however you want. And it doesn't have to move anywhere. And the rock never moves. No one can even move the rock. Hey, Andrew. Are you going to give me your couch? Uh, I've got a bust of myself that's very large. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to trade it to you for a uh, free lunch for the rest of our friendship. But will anyone else take it? That's up to you, man. In exchange. It's up to you. It's, bust. Not, it's up to them. It's a magnificent bust. The problem is I have to be convinced that someone else will accept the bust in exchange for goods and services. Probably not going to happen. Yeah. So that's why it doesn't have any value. Yep. No value. No consumer confidence in my bust. <laughs> So we were trying to figure out if if money is inherently corrupt because I was kind of I've always been kind of interested in how how it began. Uh, this is like a quote from Ayn Rand, actually. Atlas Shrugged. Um, so money is the root of all evil was something they were challenging in, in Atlas Shrugged. Uh, she thinks that money is the well, root of biblical. all. Well, that's biblical. Is that biblical? I'm not actually sure where it came came from. I yeah. think it's I think it's New Testament. I think Jesus said it or something. Oh, interesting. Ayn Rand said that money was the root of all good because it motivates people to do things, basically, because Hmm. it motivates them to actually harness their energies and and achieve things. Yeah, I think maybe a better version of that saying might be greed is the root of all evil or something. Well, I don't know. I mean, so I guess Ayn Rand would say that greed motivates you to 
want things and do things. It's kind of like we were talking about boredom, remember? And greed is kind of like the opposite of boredom. If you want things, then you're going to go out and do things. I would say greed is a unhealthy mutation of some self-preserving impulse. Yeah, I think greed is often viewed in a negative context, like it's over the top. Obviously, you can have too much avarice or greed desire for money and stuff like because that. Because nobody so, nobody yeah. nobody resents somebody who just eats food that is theirs. It's their food. It should, you know, it's it, they're not going to like send it to somebody else who doesn't belong to. They're going to eat it cuz it's theirs. Nobody sees that as selfish, but they might see somebody like at the top of the wealth distribution as greedy. You're saying if instead of money we all just had sacks of flour which have value, we wouldn't mind if you didn't give away the flour to people who are starving? I'm not personally saying I think any of these things. I'm just saying that these are things people talk about. These are... Yeah. I mean... I'm just addressing... I'm poking holes. Yeah. So I, I think that money is just a medium of exchange because it's fluid, because it can be exchanged for anything. It has a lot more kind of value than any other... Like a barter system really wouldn't work because it's just super inconvenient. What about, um, what, what kind of place does money have in a society where there are no assets? Because millennials, they own fewer homes than any other people in history. There's like no, maybe not in, in all of history, but in, in modern history, millennials are kind of an exception of, of home ownership. No, they aren't buying homes. They're just renting, you know, and, uh, and I think it stands to reason that, that millennials are not making as many investments as, as previous generations. So what happens when with money when there are no assets for the money to represent? Well, it's not just assets. So you're, I think you're onto something in a sense that people are much more minimalist than they were before, mm -hmm. but that's different from the housing problem. I mean, uh, there is kind of a, a crisis. Well, they're that, not buying homes because they don't have the savings for it. And stuff right. Like that's that. true. Yeah, absolutely. How, there is a bit of a housing crisis that houses are just too expensive. One thing is the baby boomers, I think to a large extent still live in their homes and I think once the baby boomers, you know, sort of move out of their homes or die, then there will be an adjustment probably in house prices. You mean, you mean baby boomers are living in homes that are too big for them and that's a problem? No, they're just li still living <laughs> at all. <laughs> and they're living in homes. <laughs> so, you know, uh, at some point those homes are going to be vacant and that will adjust the housing market, right? Are you Thanos in real life? No. No? They are going to die. I guess it's not that depressing. That's a good movie, though. It is a good movie. It's kind of sad, though, don't you think? Yeah, but I, the, I but the population the is out of control. The population is out of control. That's the genius of Thanos. I, I don't think that's really true. We talk, Did we talk about this? Population overpopulation? Oh, we should talk about this. That's another one. Okay. It's not this one. Yeah. But, yeah, we should talk about it. I wonder what the first, like, paper money was, because you, you're talking about these seashells that you love so much and all these <laughs> uh, all these uh, minerals that have intrinsic value because they're rare. But what was the first, do you know the first currency that was paper? Yeah, it seems to us that most money kind of throughout history had value. So it was a precious metal or something mm -hmm. like, or a seashell, as I keep coming right, back yeah, to. You love the seashells. I love the seashells. But um, gold or silver or copper, right, those seem to be the main source of money. Uh, but if you look at our United States money, it says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So it's basically like a, it's actually, I think, called a promissory note. And actually back in, during the Civil War, banks used to issue their own bills. There were like a thousand different types of currency in circulation before about 200 years ago. So if I was ago. a Bank of America customer versus like you USAA might have or something, you it might would look a, different. Yeah. yeah. And in a sense, we still have that uh, like as a check. Or a travel, traveler's check or something like that. Or different looking but debit cards. But basically like a bill of money is basically an IOU, mm. right? And so you're just trading around IOUs. Um, and yeah, each each bank would issue its own money. Uh, it's, it's In fact, money is basically like paper bill. It's called a banknote. Anyway, the first paper money though was China, I believe Tang Dynasty, around like 700 or 800, something like that. CE, I guess. Yeah, CE. People were really skeptical of paper money at first, obviously, because paper money is basically just the government just writing. Like, <laughs> yes, the government is this writing IOU. Yeah, this is a hundred gold pieces. <laughs> writing, they're just yeah. writing it on a piece yeah. of paper, right? <laughs> yeah, it's obviously easier to forge. Although it's, it's actually pretty easy to forge gold too, because you how do you tell um, like what type of metal it really is. That's what debasing is, debasing mm. the currency, right? Like if you mix it with lead or other metals and stuff. Interesting. So people used, I mean, transactions in the past with money used to be just like you would take your piece of gold 
And if I say, like, this cow costs one ounce of gold, you'd shave off enough gold off your piece, right? Like, before... Before there were coins. Coins. Yeah. Well, so even when there were coins, gold was just worth something, too. It depends on the They're site. weighing out the gold on a gram scale, like yes. you do in a dispensary? Absolutely. And you weigh out how much gold. You shave off a little more, shave wow. off a little more, and then people would be able to test it, taste it, or whatever it is to find out if it's really gold. Wow. But yeah, yeah. So paper money was, it's easier to uh, authenticate yeah. than, than, than gold. Uh, and it's also easier to copy, though, because mm. I can just get a printing press and stamp it. Like, the government has to have better technology to be able to come. Like Frank Abagnale Jr., the, the, the catch me if you can guy. That guy oh, who was like the youngest. He was a counterfeiter? Yeah, he was the youngest living, the, the youngest and uh, most successful con artist ever to have lived. And he went on to work with the government and he actually yeah. helped them like track down. This is what Catch Me If You Can is about. Oh, okay. Brilliant okay. movie. I've seen the movie. Um, so actually, the coinage, too, like you always think about those coins with like, in Canada, we still have Queen Elizabeth on our coins. Mm. You always have the king or the queen on your coin, right? Or now, I guess we have what Lincoln and uh, Washington and stuff. Who's Soon to coins? be Trump at this rate. Uh, when do we get not. a dollar bill with Trump's face on it? Uh, I want it. I don't think it will. I want to see it so bad. Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but this is how taxes worked, right? So nowadays you, you like pay your taxes every year, pay a little bit out of your paycheck, stuff like that. Uh, pay taxes on goods. They just charge you at the store. But it's really hard to organize a system like that back during the Roman Empire, the Greeks, stuff like this. they had no computers. Right. Well, they had, I mean, we did this before computers, but they really didn't have a lot of, well, they had a bureaucratic system, but it was just kind of not as comprehensive or as well organized or whatever as, as we have. So how do you charge people taxes on stuff? Like if you want to sell your grain at the market. Well, let's, let's put a pin here. I've got a better question. What, yeah. what is, well, it's not a better question. It's just like, I think we need to establish this first. What is, what is the purpose of taxes? Because you could, I've always wondered, like, the people who are at the top who own the land, they seem like they would have access to any of the resources produced in that land. So why would they need money to begin with? Well, do they own the land is one thing. So, I mean, the government doesn't actually own very much land But they can seize the property. States. They can kick people out of their houses and, like... Yeah, in a domain, but they have to pay them... They have to pay a market rate for it, right? You're talking about, like... So even back in the Middle Ages or something like that, they didn't necessarily own the land, but lords. But it started out. Let's, 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 let's get the, the labor of serfs. Yeah, let's let's just let's just get let's just start at the beginning real quick. So, the very first person to found a civilization, yeah. it would have been their land. It, they would have they would have had first dibs to all the best uh, cuts of the meat, like yeah. the meat sacrifices that were made would have gone to the kings and the priests. Yeah, and the, and the kings and the priests would have gotten the select choice of the produce pro and, yeah. and, the land and stuff. So, at what point did the owners of the land? start participating in money. Yeah. So it wasn't really money back then. Probably. Um, we're talking back in like Babel, Babylon and Egypt and stuff like that. Ancient civilizations. Right. And this is why I said they paid their workers in beer because, and grain, really they paid their workers in grain, but often the grain was basically like mashed, um, grain mixed with water, which is basically beer. Right. Actually, porridge, too, used to be beer. It's like an unfiltered pilsner, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. Like what they ate for breakfast, the pilgrims, uh, people in New England and stuff, they kind of ate porridge, which was a little off. And it was basically like mashed beer. Well, yeah, I mean, the the I mean, societies are built on wheat, barley, corn, grain. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. So agriculture. So this would have been money. I mean, in back in China, rice was money. Babylon, grain like um, wheat and barley would have been money. Rye, maybe. Um, These were easy crops to cultivate. Yeah, they were predictable. Relatively easy to store. Like you can transfer some. Gro you can make a lot of different of stuff grain. out of it. It's yeah. versatile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so you're right. This is this is definitely a form of money. Is the grain itself? Okay. So at one point, I guess what I'm saying is that these grains and stuff that were really easy to produce were kind of like the first kind of reproducible resources. Yeah, you know, and at, you would pay your taxes in grain. So mm -hmm. farmers throughout history generally have paid their taxes in produce. So do you know when, uh, at what point did tax become important? Because it seems like tax is only there to, I guess, keep the civilization running. People who are running the civilization obviously get a cut of the taxes. Yeah, to and how extent, far does that go? And when did, the, when did royalty start participating in that, in that, as opposed to just like using the resources that were producing their land to survive? 
So to some extent, civilization and the hierarchy has always been a protection racket, which is basically you have people who offer protection in exchange for goods and services. So Mm -hmm. the farmer works the land, they pay the magistrate or whatever who pays up to the, uh, the emperor or the king and the king in turn protects the farmer, hires soldiers and armies to protect them from the next civilization and stuff like that. And they take the skim a cut off the surface and build their nice gold palace. (laughs) But is the king participating in that in this, in this, hypothetical situation is the king getting yeah. a cut of that money yeah, is he yeah, spending yeah, yeah. It? so why does he need to house. why doesn't the king just go this is my land i can just take whatever i want well they do yeah so but they set the tax rate yeah but but at what point did did the did the royalty start wanting money the money that but grain is the same thing as money it's just in a form of exchange right so so when did money come about well money the only difference between grain and money is that like or like gold coins or whatever if we're talking about money i mean grain is a form of money but the only difference between like grain and coins is that coins are a little bit um easier to move around easier to store Stuff like that, right? It's just a little more convenient. So when did coins first come about? Uh, I don't know, but certainly by ancient Greece, Phoenicia, they had coins. I don't know if anyone before the Romans stamped the coins with, like, probably the Persians did. But the shekels existed in Old Testament times, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that probably ancient Egypt, uh, Babylon, Samaria, these places all had forms of currency. Shekels, I guess, was one of them. So writing was actually invented to record transactions. That's the whole purpose of cuneiform writing. So it's basically just um, kind of like Microsoft Excel or something is recording transactions. Like you give a certain amount of grain, pay your taxes, uh, recording how much you as farmer Julian paid this season uh, into the treasury, the coffers. So uh, that was the whole purpose of writing. Uh, the Greeks later changed writing to make it kind of like prose, like stories. But originally it was just kind of recording transactions. So money is not, we just settled it. Money is not a system that was invented to keep people working. It was just invented to make it easier to trade and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, just facilitate. Money is just um, a middleman of trade, basically. It's a facilitator. So it's kind of, uh, it's a medium of exchange that can be used to exchange for any other type of goods. But when we were talking about coinage, so shekels obviously was a form of coinage. Babylon, Egypt, they probably had coinage. But one of the things that, for example, the Romans did and medieval kings and stuff, they put their own head on the coin, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're, because it was coin issued by you as the king. That was part of the consumer confidence back then. If the king issued it, it must be good. Yes, but it was also a form of tax collection because what happened was, say you're in the reign of Augustus. Augustus Caesar is the big Roman emperor, the first Roman emperor. And then Augustus dies and his successor, Tiberius, issues a currency. They collect all the Augustus coins, melt them down, and create new Tiberius Uh, coins. And if you turn in 10 Augustus coins, you get back eight Tiberius coins. uh, And they keep the difference. And that's a form of taxation. uh, And you can't spend any Augustus coins anymore because they're not in circulation. So you have no choice but to adapt. Right. You have no choice but to adopt the new Tiberius coins. And the difference, the the 20% that you lost, is a form of tax. Interesting. So we came to use paper money because that's the easiest way. We found that to be the easiest way at a certain point to, you know, authenticate somebody's net worth, you know, to, to validate somebody's net worth, their, the assets they have. It's the easiest way to trade. You don't want to carry your livestock around. You don't want to carry gold coins around. Paper's best. Now we're moving into a territory where people don't want to carry. I mean, I if I have more than like $40 cash in my wallet, I start freaking out because I'm like, I got to get rid of this. This is worthless. Yeah. People it, don't have cash anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually funny because this it's opposite. This is actually the opposite in Japan. In Japan, if you have, uh, if you pay with your debit card or if you're seen pay, paying for anything with a debit card or credit card, they assume you have no money. Hmm. And if you use cash, it's like a sign of affluence. Whereas here in the West, wow. it's it's reversed. So yeah. they, it does seem like we're kind of, you know, we're all heading towards this uh, this digital currency, Bitcoin mm-hmm. or whatever. It's, you know, there's going to be some kind of like blockchain currency in the future that probably is what we're going to use, right? So, well, first US dollars. And then obviously there's also this Bitcoin thing on the side and other forms of digital currency. Oh, you're saying US dollars was first. Yeah, but, but, you know, you could have blockchain U.S. dollars. So it's not like 
Bitcoin is anything special necessarily, right? It's like the te- there's a difference between Bitcoin, the currency, and blockchain, the technology. Right. And you could use a blockchain exchange system for U.S. dollars. That's true. That's and interesting. And that yeah. might happen at some point. Yeah. Certain countries are really plugged into the internet, like Estonia does everything online. You just there's no paper of any kind and you just fill in your public profile online. You do, you vote online, you do taxes online through like a government portal. And it's possible to envision like a system where all currency would just be blockchain, even though it's really just U S dollars. Right. So we're not all going to have to get forced. to well, use Ultimately, Bitcoin. I think it has to be U S dollars to some extent in the United States, because that is how taxes work. That is how the government collects revenue. And it's the power of the government is the ability to raise taxes is, I mean, that's where the government derives its power from. So are we heading towards a global currency? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not an economist, but certainly we have an international system of exchange that already is well in effect. It seems like you're saying it won't happen because it's, it seems all built upon comparative advantage and what's being produced in different countries. Yeah. So there are advantages and disadvantages to adopting certain currencies like Greece uh, would be now use the euro, but then it wanted to leave the eurozone. There was some question about whether it was to its benefit because, uh, and this is a bit of a trade thing too, because if your currency is lower, so countries often intentionally debase their currency, like lower the value of their currency because it's a trade benefit. It means you'll buy more of their stuff. Like China is, is accused of doing this a lot. They lower intentionally lower the value of their currency. So it's cheaper to buy stuff from China. So you buy more stuff from China, which employs more Chinese people in factories and um, raises their economy because they produce stuff, right? So it's a help to their economy because they get a tra- trade advantage because it's cheaper to buy their stuff. But it lowers the quality of life for its citizens by doing this, right? Not if they have jobs. I but, mean, if but you, it's but it's 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 more work that they're doing for the same amount of money. Yeah, but I mean, if your if your goal is to employ as many people as possible, it's exactly what you want to do. Okay, so you're saying that they're forced into this position because of the size of their population. No, it's just where they came from uh, in economic standpoint. They're still a growing economy. That's nothing. So I I think one of the things that comes up a lot is population size, but population size kind of has nothing to do with the total amount of money because it just makes the pie larger. Right, because, because an economy is, yeah. is people buying stuff. That so the more sense. people there are, the more people there are buying stuff. And the more things that are being produced too. Yeah, absolutely. So it totally scales, so right? So we actually need to be able to, pr- pr- to print more money yeah. in order to uh, compensate for the amount of people that are that are in that area. Yeah, like, I mean, the reason why China and America are so connected and some people even call it chimerica is because the U S has a lot of people with a lot of money. So it's a big market for China to sell stuff. And China has a lot of people, uh, and low labor costs. So they are able to produce stuff. So China can sell stuff to America and America can buy stuff from China. And so China ends up with money and, and America ends up with cheap stuff at Walmart. Is this a problem? Not necessarily. No. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a problem. It does seem like a codependent relationship that America has with China, but that's a separate <laughs> issue. It kind of is, yeah. It's interesting the way that we use money today because it used to represent the assets that we had, like the, the, the crops we were growing, whatever we were producing on an individual level. But now, now like the common person doesn't produce stuff. We just kind of consume. So, you know, you have all this, you have like the stock market and you have these people who just make all their money by just trading money and, 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 you know, investing and stuff like that. So it's, it's like, we've totally money has evolved to now. Like it's, 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 its own, it's like, it's whole, it's like a whole other world. It's like mm-hmm. moneyception, you know? That's really interesting too, because there's way more money in circulation than actually exists to some extent. So a bank takes in money, but then it lends out money. Mainly a bank actually loans money to other people. And there's laws. This is like the Dodd-Frank thing, uh, laws that they instituted um, during the last financial collapse on how much money a bank can actually lend out. But say a bank takes in $100, it usually lends out at least 95 of those dollars. And who's it lend it to? Often it lends it to other banks. And then that bank lends out a fraction of of that money, right? So a bank will take in $100, lend $95 to another bank, and then that bank has then 
$95 and will lend $90 to another bank. But it means that there's this massive expansion of money. It's, it's literally creating money by all these banks lending money around. The banks are basically assuming that no more than 5% of their clientele are going to withdraw everything. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Moment. And that's called a run on a bank if you can't actually fulfill uh, your obligations if people come and want money. This is why when I need to buy a sofa, I have to call my bank. <laughs> because they don't they don't want to give me my money they don't want to is be, that true yeah oh, any, you should probably switch banks or buy cheaper sofas you should definitely buy cheaper sofas <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a regular occurrence but it has happened before. you've never had to call your bank to a to, a, to buy a, a sofa to, a, to approve so. a purchase you've never had to call a bank uh not unless there was like some security thing involved is that what you mean I mean, I just, I mean, maybe I'm an exception and I've, I mean, here's the thing. I I've, I have to make a decent amount of uh, expensive purchases through my business because like we buy gear and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah. so, yeah, yeah, I'm all the time having to call my bank, convincing them to give me my own money. And it infuriates me because I should just be able to swipe my card. I think that's more a security thing than anything else. Yeah. Okay. But, <laughs> well, I mean, really, but maybe not, maybe not, maybe. Well, they can't really refuse to give you your money and that's can't. the problem because in many cases, uh, that a run of the bank is when they are, are not able to give everyone their money because they literally do not have it. Most of the money that you give to a bank, they lend away to other banks. Uh, That's what I'm getting at. And then that money ends up, you know, they're assuming that money. not everybody's going to want their money at the same time. Right. But if they Absolutely. did, that would be 100%. a big problem. Yeah. So uh, that's what, that's what depressions are made out of. Yeah, and that's why you charge interest, and that's why a bank will pay you interest, is because your money has some value over time, because they can use that money to do things with it. That's the purpose. Like, a bank mm. basically pays you interest because they're spending your money to do things with it. It seems like there's no bad way for this to go down. Money seems like a like just basically a reflection of your immediate available resources, and the more people that are participating in any given society there has to be more money in order for, you know, the pie has to grow because production is going up. And so there's more yeah, products right. and there's, you know, it's, it's, it's all supply and demand. So people adding, so, so a government adding money to their circulation isn't necessarily diminishing the value of it overall. It's just in a context where we're adding people to like, if there's like a huge influx of immigrants into the, into America, for example, and we have to print like all this new money to accommodate for that, it's not really like we're devaluing the money because we have more people producing more things here, right? Yeah, sort of. So money supply is going to expand naturally as you have more goods, more people. Um, and that's fine. And that doesn't decrease it because as you, I guess what you're saying is you can increase the money supply and increase the goods at the same time. And it doesn't necessarily lead to ma massive inflation. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, it's similar to that. I'm saying that you have to increase the amount of available money if there's more people in in the participating in the economy, if there's more citizens, right? But it doesn't lead to inflation. It doesn't lead to inflation because those right. those people are producing things, hopefully, that are adding right. to the market. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that's that's true. Yeah. The other thing is the economy is really complex. All these banks lending to each other, and I think that no one really understands how it all works. I think we we have economists who are basically scientists who study the economy and they understand how bits and pieces of it work. And different economies they, work differently, right? Uh, or are they all maybe, the same? Maybe, but I mean, you have different, you know, you know, have a global economy, you have an economy of individual countries and they're connected in some forms of exchange. You have, you know, stock markets and things like that. And so we all, we, we understand elements of it. We certainly understand how like individual phenomenon work, but once you put it all together as one giant piece, no one really understands how it works. We can't reliably predict when the next economic crash is going to come. It seems to go through cycles up and down. No one really knows when the next cycle is coming, what part of the cycle we're in. So we can study it and we understand kind of, it's kind of like just a really complex system with tons of variables, it's like a human brain or something. We understand bits and pieces of it. We understand how like one individual piece of it works. So if you ask me like how one part of the economy works, I can probably tell you, but how the economy works in general overall or what's going to happen with it, that's something that is kind of beyond the understanding of almost anyone. Is that just because the economy is kind of, it's got its own, a life of its own now, or is it because it's just too yeah. big of a... Yeah, it's just too complex. I mean, it's like the internet. It's like, uh, or a brain is a good analogy, or the internet It's just like billions of connections. Every, you know, we have millions of people, 350 million people in the United States 
doing individual things, making decisions for themselves in a free market, deciding if they want to buy a home or want to go to the grocery store and buy some groceries or want to buy a car or want to go to college or want to create a college savings fund or want to invest in stock or whatever it is. Everyone is individually making decisions. There's 350 million people making probably hundreds or thousands of decisions each. And so it's it's really difficult to predict all of that and put it all together and to, to understand, get a, get a view of what's going on in total. We understand bits of it. We understand how individual things work, but no one, I think, really understands how it all works together. It just kind of does. It's like almost its own creature. It's like the internet, just tons of networks working together. Wow, we talked a lot about money. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> That's about all we have time for today. I appreciate you listening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you are enjoying these episodes and you want to support this podcast, you can do that by subscribing, by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcast or CastBox. This helps tremendously with getting us into the ranking systems, and we certainly appreciate it. If you want to send me an email, you can do that. Hello at spellboundshow.com. Although most people just tweet me at Julian was here. Also, at Julian was here on Facebook and Instagram, although I don't use social media much these days. If you tweet me and I don't respond right away, don't take it personally. It's not you. It's me. I'm Julian Smith. This has been Spellbound. Thanks so much for listening. See you next Monday.